welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast set firmly in the grey maybe of the series universe. My name is Aramithius, and today I'm discussing that mysterious state of being that seems to grant superpowers in the Elder Scrolls. It's been compared to enlightenment, it's been compared to lucid dreaming, it's even been compared to breaking the fourth wall and using the construction kit. Today I'm asking, what is Chim and how does it actually work? Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this is my own understanding of Chim and the ideas surrounding it, and not a definite answer. This is one of the areas of the Elder Scrolls lore where fans have very divergent opinions, and there's an awful lot of talk, and not a lot of certainty. And so, please, 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 go to the sources yourselves, look through them, and make your own conclusions. And you may have other ideas. If so, I'd absolutely love to hear them. Please feel free to leave a comment on the blog article accompanying this podcast at writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com or join the conversation at the Written in Uncertainty Discord channel. I look forward to hearing from you. Now to start off with, Chim, or Kim, or Kaim, however you pronounce it, is also described very extensively with mu- with metaphors and figures of speech and so getting a precise handle on it is a little difficult. To add to that, the biggest sources that we have on this are known to be liars in many circumstances. We have sources mostly from Vivek, also from Mankar Cameron and to a degree Heimskir from White Run, so they're not necessarily the most reliable of characters. For the purposes of this, I'm having to assume that they are at least not attempting to deliberately mislead us, simply so that we have something to talk about here. Because if we start thinking that Vivek particularly is lying about the information that Z is giving us about Chim, then we don't have an awful lot to go on. And so we can kick off with talking about what is it? What is Chim? In brief, and this is probably the um, the only real point of agreement you're going to get throughout the whole of the Elder Scrolls community on this, is that it's one of the walking ways, one of the formulas to heaven by violence, and that it is a state that's of some sort of enlightenment or power that's imparted to an, ind- an individual. I'll be discussing what the walking ways are precisely later on in this podcast, just remember them for now, and just to kick off with a reasonably succinct definition from some sources about what Chim is and what it can do, we have Vex Teaching, which is a text that was written by Michael Kirkbride at some point, I don't know exactly when, Um, but to quote it says, to, tr- to transcend mortal boundaries set in place by mortal rulers. At its simplest, the state of Chim provides an escape from all known laws of the divine worlds and the corruption of the Black Sea of Oblivion. It is a return to the first brush of Anupadame, where stasis and change create possibility. More so, it is the essence needed to hold that dawning together without disaster. One that knows Chim observes the tower without fear, more so, he resides within. Now that statement will take quite a bit of unpacking. I'm going to use that as a framework to talk through the first part of this cast when we talk about what Chim is. So first of all, Chim provides an escape from all known laws of the divine worlds and the corruption of the Black Sea of Oblivion. That's about as close as we get to an explanation of its effects from Vivek and what it can do for you, so we get a sense of It allows you to do things that normal mortals can't, and to a degree, what gods can't. And we get a more explicit pointer from this, from Mankar Cameron, who talks about it in the sense that those who know it can reshape the land, witness the home of the Red King once jungled. So, you have Chim, and you can reshape the land, you can reshape the world. And... That's a pretty huge deal, um, which leaves a huge question of why on earth doesn't it happen more? 
but I will get to that when we talk about how you understand what Chim is and the state of mind you need to be in for it. One of the other questions which brings in one of the potential interpretations for Chim is can you manipulate more than the land? We don't really know for certain to be fair but it also brings in the idea of if it's the land is it, pe is it the people as well? Is it the things within the land? And also the potential of, for an explanation of is it everything within Tamriel or everything within the games which brings in an explanation for Chim where people think that it's potentially a fourth wall joke and it's people saying well if you know Chim you can manipulate reality by using the construction kit or the creation kit and alter things that way. There's a fantastic blog series on that particular form of interpretation of the 36 lessons of Vivek and Chim particularly. It's called The Metaphysics of Morrowind and it's on falling awkwardly dot maybe dot wordpress dot com or just dot com I don't remember but I will be posting a link in the blog post that accompanies this cast check it out through there. It goes into an awful lot of detail about the various fourth wall jokes that are in the 36 lessons. Things like cutting sleep holes in order to give yourself potions and heal yourself up. Reaching the edge of the map and finding the pointed water, which is a reference to a glitch that was in the Elder Scrolls Adventures Red Guard. So it's entirely possible that you can read all the stuff about Chim and think it's a fourth wall joke. That's a perfectly valid interpretation. It's not it's not one that I particularly agree with because I think it personally cheapens the idea of Chim and the idea of everything that goes on within the Elder Scrolls universe because it becomes self-referential. It means that you can't dig any deeper because the ultimate explanation is it's a computer, it's a computer game and so you don't need to think about it anymore. One of the other um, more simple and basic explanations that has a bit more depth to it is that Chim is lucid dreaming. It's, well, it's lucid dreaming within reality. Um, that you can be aware that you are in a dream and that you are then able to control it as you will. This goes into a fair bit about the fundamental structure of the Elder Scrolls universe and I don't want to dive too deeply into it but there's the notion that's hinted at in the 36 lessons of Vivek and elsewhere that the point that I keep coming back to in the 36 lessons is the quote that is again repeated a lot is that the working that is that the waking world is the amnesia of dream in other words the waking world is a dream that's forgotten it's a dream and so by attaining Chim you realize the world is a dream and that you can therefore control that dream. On to the second part of our quote which is it is a return to the first brush of Anu Padme where stasis and change created possibility. Now this is going back to an understanding of what the Arabis fundamentally is. We've said you understand it's a dream but this is more than that it's understanding the structure of the Arabis and everything that happens within the grey maybe that is the universe of the Elder Scrolls. The 36 lessons of Vivek and certain other texts within the Elder Scrolls point to the structure of the universe being that of a wheel the Mundus being the hub and the eight main Aedra, the eight, who are often referred to as the gift limbs, forming the eight spokes of the wheel. And then with the eight spokes you get the 16 gaps in between it, which are the 16 Daedric Princes. This isn't a precise picture, I don't think, particularly given how ESO presents Oblivion and the in relationship between Mundus and Oblivion, but it's a way of conceptualising the Elder Scrolls universe. And then when you think about the wheel outside of the spokes and the spaces, the rim, then you can also play around with that idea of being Aetherius 
and that sort of thing. And that's more or less what gets played around with in the Sermon 21 quote, which talks about how you see the world as a chimster, as someone who has achieved chim. So we have we have this quote. Fifth, look at the majesty sideways and all you see is the tower, which our ancestors made idols from. Look at its centre and all you see is the begotten hole, second serpent, womb ready for the right reaching, exact and without enchantment. Sixth, the heart of the second serpent holds the secret triangular gate. Seventh, look at the secret triangular gate sideways and you see the secret tower. Eighth, the secret tower within the tower is the shape of the only name of God, I. Now we have that disclosure there. The shape of the shape of the secret tower within the tower is the shape of the only name of God, I. Now you remember that the Elder Scrolls universe is a wheel. What happens when you turn a wheel on its side? When you are looking at it head on, you're not looking at the spokes or the hub but you are looking straight at the outside of the wheel itself. You have an eye, which is the tower that's talked about here. And thanks to some wordplay here, it then implies that the eye that is the universe is also the self. And so you think, I am the universe. I am, I am both part of this dream and the whole dream dream itself, which is a fundamental paradox which will cause problems that we will talk about a bit later. Um, but you also have within the 36 lessons talk about being about being a, a ruling king, which is a term that kind of connects to the king of the Enantiomorph. If you want more information on the Enantiomorph, please check out the previous cast to this one. But a ruling king in the 36 lessons is also used to refer to someone who has chim, as, and they're often described as being a city or a state, which is both a thing and many entities at once within it. So if you're talking about a particular city, you've got that you've got the city, you've also got the buildings within the city that that and the things that the residents and landmarks and everything that make up that city that are many things at once. That's the kind of contradictions and parallels that are being drawn within Chim here. And that's also the point of why it's not used to defeat your enemies, which we mentioned earlier. It's not used to turn on people because if you realise that you are the universe in a fundamental way, if you are if you are destroying people, if you are blinking them out of existence, you are changing yourself as well. You are harming yourself. And so, never mind that change of the self is an inherently hard process anyway, which I think may have something to do with that. But if you are using it to defeat your enemies, you are in a essence committing some form of self-harm, which is why we don't see people using Chim to obliterate everyone they don't like. And I also think it's important to point out here that the Chimster still retains their sense of individuality. That's very, very key to the whole state and it's going to frame the discussion that we go through for the next part of the quote, which is more so it is the essence needed to hold that dawning together without disaster. One that knows Chim observes the tower without fear. Vex teaching kind of elaborates on this a bit more in a um, later section, which says, what is the tower's secret? How to permanently exist beyond duplexity, antithesis, or trouble. This is not an easy concept, I know. Imagine being able to feel with all your senses the relentless alien terror that is God and your place in it, which is everywhere and therefore nowhere, and realising that it means the total disillusion of your individuality into boundless being. Imagine that, and still being able to say, I. The I is the tower. Now that also brings us back to the feeling of the city and a state and potentially being lost in it. That's the real kind of realisation we're talking here. The sense of you are in everything and therefore nothing, but you are in something 
is the ultimate realization there. The law community have connected this with the idea of zero summing, which has been presented in one of Michael Copebride's texts, which is called Et Arda, Eight Adra, Eat the Dreamer. This is where a moth priest reaches ultimately the realization that there is no real reality that there it's um, that reality within the Elder Scrolls is inherently uncertain and balanced between Akka and Lorcan in a very very precarious way. I think it's summed up beautifully with the kind of with the starting quote for that particular piece, which is the Adroth Akka, who goes by so many names as to perhaps already suggest what I'm about to commit to Memospor, is completely insane. His mind broke when his perch from eternity allowed the day, and we of all the Arbus live through live on through its fragments, ensnared in the temporal writings and erasures of the a causal whim that he begat by saying I am in the etheric thunder of self applause that followed, nay rippled until convention, that is amnesia, is is any wonder that the time god would hate the same twin on the other end of the hour umbilical cord, the space god, that any creation would be so utterly dangerous because of that singular fear of a singular word's addition, I am not. Chim is holding the ideas of I am and I am not in balance. The idea that you can be able to say I both am an individual and not an individual because I am everything at once. The law community has connected Zero Sum and Chim because of that kind of contradiction, that maths of of I am one minus one, I am not, having to still equal one in the case of Chim. I'm not a huge fan of that particular interpretation because it implies that Zero Sum is a failure and the text itself doesn't really support that idea because it talks about someone who achieves zero sum and there are various consequences that seem to happen after the text um, recording, so to speak, that suggest it's something beyond that. And you've also, I've also want to clear up some things that the community seem to have got into its head about zero summing while I'm here, because there's not really a better place to discuss it. Um, the biggest issue that I've seen is that zero sum is some sort of retroactive erasure. If you fail to do the maths of Chim, that you will then zero sum and then no one will ever remember you existed. That you will just wink out of existence and be absorbed into the cosmic everything and you will never have existed. That is utter rubbish. Because we have a text talking about zero sum. It's a record of someone who achieved zero sum. I don't know how it ever got to the point where the community thought, oh yeah, zero sum means you never existed. That's rubbish. The on th Again, the only text we have about zero sum is from someone who zero summed. So, I don't know. Anyway, rant over... Um, Chim is also linked with the notion of mastery in this sense. It's holding those things in balance. And Vivek's sermons also point to the notion of being able to hold two contradictory ideas and either express or balance them out as being mastery. It's also something that's present in, I think, Chinese thought somewhere. I've certainly heard it within reference to something to do with the journey to the West. The idea that if you can do multiple things, if you can hold multiple contradictory and potentially contradictory things in balance and still function, you are a master. Which is what Chim is here. You are balancing the I am with the I am not to a degree, um, to the degree that you can exploit both. And I think exploit is probably the right word here. If you look at those two who have apparently attained Chim, both Vivek and Talos, they are incredibly egotistical, incredibly selfish people. And they aren't the ones to say that in the face of this cosmic oneness, oh, this is wonderful, I'm going to be nothing. No, they're going to say, screw that, I want stuff for me, 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 me. And there's that 
very definite sense of that arrogance that they would express in the face of such a cosmic truth, which I think contributes to why they have attained Chim. And, or have they? I just want to have a quick diversion here while I think about it. It's particularly vague in the case of Talos or Tiber Septim, um, whether or not he's attained Chim, because we now have the text from Lady Cinnabar in Elder Scrolls Online, which is Subtropical Cyrodiil, a speculation. The main thing that Talos is supposed to have done with Chim is change Cyrodiil from jungle into temperate forest. We have the text from the many-headed Talos, um, which is quoted by Heimskir in the, in the Elder Scrolls V. You have suffered for me to win this throne, and I see how you hate jungle. Let me show you the power of Talos Stormcrown, born of the north, where my breath is long winter. I breathe now in royalty and reshape this land which is mine. I do this for you, Red Legions, for I love you. Notice we have the little nod there of breathe now in royalty to, for Chim. And we also have Mankar's account, which talks about the home of the Red King once jungled, in reference to Chim. However, we do have the late Lady Cinnabar's text, the subtropical Cyrodiil, a speculation, which suggests that the manipulation of the White Gold Tower is what changed Cyrodiil's climate, rather than Chim itself. So we've got an alternate answer there, which means that the one thing that we know that Tiber Septim did, or at least thought we knew that Tiber Septim did with Chim, is not necessarily done by Chim. And we also got some reason to doubt Vivek as well. He's he's a poet and therefore a liar, and he also had access to the heart of Lorcan, which granted a fair amount of power on its own. So it's entirely possible that everything that he did and uh, he did was down to the power of the heart and not Chim itself. And so with all that said, how do you actually attain this? We've talked through the knowledge that you need to get to to understand what Chim is, but you can quite obviously have that knowledge without attaining it itself, or without attaining the state itself. Mankar shows knowledge of Chim and its capabilities at least, and he plainly doesn't have it. So what do we need to do in order to attain Chim? I think I've got an answer here, so if you can bear with me with my speculation here. I personally think it has something to do with understanding the enantiomorph as a fundamental pattern of the Albus. I don't know for sure, but this is my speculation simply from some of the wordings for we get from Sermon 21 and Sermon 13. In the Sermon 21 wordings, we, it already talks about the heart of the second serpent holds the secret triangular gate. The enantiomorph has three points. I can't hear Vivek talking about triangles and not think that he's talking about an enantiomorph of some sort. So when he's, talk, when he's talking about the secret triangular gate, I think it's some reference to the fact that all this opening of the tower and so on is enabled through the secret triangular gate saying look at the secret triangular gate sideways and you will see the secret tower and we also have in sermon 13 the secret syllable of royalty is this you must learn this elsewhere and of course obviously that's chim the next phrase is the temporal myth is man the magical cross is an integration of the worth of mortals at the expense of their spirits surround it with the triangle the enantiomorph, and you begin to see the triune house, which is a reference to the tribunal. It becomes divided into corners, which are ruled by our brethren, the four corners. Baal, Dagon, Malak, Shiog. Rotate the triangle, and you pierce the heart of the beginning place, the foul lie, the testament of the irrefutable for a span. Rotate the triangle. If the triangle is the enantiomorph, Moving the triangle, moving one corner from one place to another, moving the rebel to the king, maybe, is one way of piercing the heart of the beginning place, going back to the first brush of Anu and Padme, and going back to the centre, that first, that first begotten hole, the second serpent, and all that. I think that 
has to be that way that Vivek is saying here that in order to understand enough of the universe to attain Chim, you need to be an observer in an enantiomorph. You need to make one part of the triangle the other, which is also um, a reference, in my opinion, to the Sermon of the Master, which is Sermon 11, which is one and one, in ele- an inelegant number. Can you tell the difference? I can, and therefore that's why you need me. Roughly that. Um, in that passage... Vivek is talking about why Z is necessary, that Z is an observer in an enantiomorph. I c- again, I think that's very, very relevant to potentially going on some steps to Chim and understanding how the enantiomorph works as a fundamental pattern, as a gateway to seeing the fullness of the Arabus and the eye that is the tower. Now, I'm not saying that if you're an observer in an enantiomorph, you can at- have a chain Chim, but I think that's the first step, maybe. It's a little unclear. Again, if we look at the text from the 36 lessons and think that that a ruling king is a reference to someone who has chim, when Vivek talks about when Z became a ruling king, it's when Z drank the folded up parts of an old bone of the earth, which became akin to milk and was therefore drinkable. That really doesn't sound anything like either like the lessons of the ruling kings that Vivek gives to Nerevar, or anything like an enantiomorph. If anything, it might be a tacit admi- um, admittance that here power is dependent upon the heart of Lord Khan. But that's one of the ones I'm really not sure about because working out exactly what that means is not something that I've been able to do no matter how long I've stared at it. I would recommend checking out Rotten Deadites, The New Whirling School, see if he's had any ideas for that because I admit that's fairly shaky in my understanding. One of the things that you should definitely check out at The New Whirling School or on Reddit, I will be linking to both of these on the blog post that accompanies this podcast is Rotten Deadite's thoughts on what is love. We've mentioned love in passing for this and it's also quite a core concept in understanding Vivek's thinking about the world and I think understanding how Chim works as a piece of realisation. It's not love as in the romantic sense by the way. We're talking here about love in the sense as as used by the 20th century mystic Alistair Crowley. Um, he formed Thelema as a religious philosophical uh, path for people to follow. He talked about love as being an action taken under will. And we have several nods in this to the 36 lessons, particularly with the phrase love is under my will only. And so what is what is will? If if love is action under will, what is will? Will, according to Crowley, is the idea of whatever the core of your being is. Do what thou wilt is a big quote of his, as in do what you will. That's not do as you like, but that do what you would do if you weren't ever chasing result. Doing what you would naturally be inclined to do regardless of the purpose or the result. That your natural shape your um, would be your will and would therefore guide your actions. If we think about the central understanding of Chim as being the I that is the universe and the self, that fits very, very naturally to me. The idea that you need to find love as in find as in act under will as in act with the intention of becoming a god or understanding your place in the world both as the go- uh, both as an element of the Arabus and the Arabus itself, which, because the whole thing is a dream, 
then that to me smacks very very of uh, Thelemic will and that's what Vivek's talking about when he talks about love and the attainer of Chim being a lover which is in the scripture of love which I think is sermon 34 or thereabouts and that's why love is important in terms of Chim it's also potentially a thing for self-love which feeds into the arrogance we spoke about earlier as a way of maintaining your individuality in the face of the realization that you are both um you are both a person and a part of this um this this overarching dream it's also note the fr- the from the many headed talos quote I do this red lesions for I love you. That's potentially poetic license and expression in, of mundane love, but it could also be an expression of love in the sense that Vivek means it in the 36 lessons, where you're looking at an action taken using his will that would do things that he would only do without without thinking about the result which is also potentially another reason for those with chim using it so sparingly it's only doing things in accordance with their core nature that they can really do with chim maybe it's not really clear as i say to what the extent of things that people can do with chim when they have it and i know that there's a current within the Elder Scrolls fandom that is literally just Chim will give you the knowledge to do something. It's not the granting of the power in itself. It's it's the knowledge to hack reality, not the keyboard. To use an absolutely bizarre metaphor. I'm not sure quite where that came from. But I think to wrap up, I um, mean possibly put Chim in that um, in a bit of a broader context. Chim is talked about as one of the formulas to reach heaven by violence of which there are six it's they're also talked about as the walking ways and chim is numbered as the fifth of these in the 36 lessons we don't really know what many of the others are we know that mantling is the fourth and there are potentially other ones out there that have been disclosed from the love letter from the fifth era we have this quote. You in the fourth era have already witnessed many of the attempts at reaching the final subgradient of all AE, that state which exists beyond mortal death. The Numidium, the Endeavour, the Prolix Tower, Chim, the Enantiomorph, the Scarab that transforms into the new man. Now, I'm not totally convinced that this is a total book for the walking ways, because although there are six of them, it doesn't totally add up to me. There's a text somewhere. I think it's just called "More on the Sigic Endeavor," or I know it's part of it. It's part of Vex teaching, where Michael Kirkbride says that the Endeavor is a way to achieve Chim. So this doesn't feel like a totally comprehensive list, if you like, of all the walking of all the walking ways, unless there's some difference between the Sigic Endeavor and Chim itself which I'm not sure on. Um, but as I say, they've the walking ways are quite uncertain in what they are, but I think we have know enough about the ones that we do, and particularly the perspectives that we get in the 36 lessons in terms of attitudes to truth, that we can have some hint of how they work. If you look at truth within the 36 lessons, it always comes up, with a pairing with violence pretty much you have truth is my husband instructed to smash and the lines like destroyed in the manner of truth a great hammering and when nerevar realizes love is under your will only after vivek talks about how he's threatening the residents of vivek city with bardal then Vivek says he is a minister of truth. He is understanding how the threat of violence is being used against the Dunma people. Which 
to me says that truth for Vivek and potentially for the walking ways here is a form of is a form of violence it's a way of imposing your will on the world of saying you want reality to be this way and forcing reality to comply with that and the walking ways are the various techniques in which that is done chim is part of those because it's understanding that you are part of the universe and therefore in control of it and can manipulate it that's a fairly well a structured a a ramble through chim as i could manage at this point uh, the amount of redrafting i've done for this particular episode is frankly scary because there are so many tangents and so many points that you can fit in here and i'm sure i haven't covered everything so please feel free to leave a comment at writtenuncertainty.wordpress.com or join the conversation at the written and uncertainty discord i would absolutely love to hear your thoughts and having talked extensively about the eye and the secret tower in this episode i'll be moving on to the ones that were made idols of it next time next time we'll be asking what are the towers until then this podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty you've been listening to written in uncertainty a podcast written and presented by aramithius with some kind of editorial help from cyfree the music for this podcast has been kindly provided by Jan Glembotsky and Jeremy Saul. You can check out Jan's work in SoundCloud under Songs from the Lost Land, and Jeremy's Northern Diaries is available for purchase and on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.